All right. <laughs> and then uh, Weiss or Wise? Also. Wise. Wise. Okay. Wise. Just want to make sure I got that right. Okay. Yeah. My my family's last name is completely made up. All right. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh, well, the, I'm. Wait, yeah. I'm going to ask you about yeah, that. Yeah, so, okay. well, but I don't know if it's true. It's like family lore. <laughs> well, well, okay. So, so we're we, we're going to dive into our interview here. So, we're here with Melanie Wise, CEO of Fetch Robotics, and and I was just asking about the pronunciation of your name, but you told me your last name's totally made up. So, t tell me a little about this lore, as you say. Yeah. So, it's family lore. I don't know if it's true, but supposedly my my part of my family came to the United States during the potato famine. And the the kid that came to the United States was very young and he didn't know his last name. And when he got to Ellis Island, they said, you were very wise for leaving. Mm. And that was his <laughs> last name. All right. Okay. But it's really hard to say if that's the truth because you know how family will lore. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> right. You know, a lot of bar conversations that, you know, transition in time. Yeah. Well, well, now that we've given gotten the background on your name, true or not, let's get the truth about the founding of like Fetch Robotics as well. So August 8th, 2014. Yes. Correct? Yes. Not looking at my notes. Tell us, tell us what it was like getting it off the ground. Um organized or poorly organized chaos. Um <laughs> I think the 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 good thing is is that when you look at the guys I started Fetch Robotics with, um, so Mike Ferguson, Derek King, Eric Dyer, we actually all worked together at Willow Garage, um, and and you know for us we kind of had this almost telepathic way of working together. We had at Willow we had built so many robots together, and and we kind of decided early on what we wanted to do once we started the company. We got in a room, we kind of said, this is the spec, we're gonna build it to the spec and go from there. And so the first the first three or four months, we worked in a very small shared office space and we just designed it all. I mean, um, we did something that I would say most companies would be very jealous of in some ways because there were four of us and we did all of all of the de the design very quickly and what was really funny is after after we had um done all the design the mechanical and the hardware design and a lot of the early software design we started hiring employees we actually hired some some previous co-workers at at willow and you know one of them was a designer one of them was a purchasing person and dave our designer he did all the the industrial design that that um that makes fetch so unique um, and, and then we started hiring people who we hadn't worked with before and things like that. And, and one of the funnier things is we hired people who had had previous robotics experience. And so we kind of did the design and we were very confident that the parts were going to come back, go together, fine, turn on, and the robot was going to work. You know, we'd done this so many times. There was no question, you know, but some of our employees were like, yeah, sure, whatever. Like the robot's probably going to have this problem or that problem or start on fire. And all of us were like, stop, the robot will never catch on fire. We don't do that. But <laughs> <laughs> that is not in our business. Plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but, you know, I think, I think that it was, it was a pretty exciting time and, and we got an early seed round of $3 million that allowed us to get a lot of the hardware and stuff like that built and start to get to our, our early engagements with customers. And then we very quickly got a $20 million series A after mm -hmm. that um, from SoftBank. And that was, that actually gave us a lot of breathing room as a, as a startup to, to figure out the path forward in terms of some of the things around business model, because you have to remember in 2014, people weren't even calling these things AMRs. They were like, are they AGVs? Are they self-driving, SDV, self-driving mm -hmm. vehicles? Mm -hmm. I mean, they had every acronym on the, the face of the earth. And I, I came into a meeting one day, I was like, we are calling this thing AMRs. We are going to get the industry to adopt it as AMRs. And, and there was a lot of missionary work early on in the creation of the company for helping people understand the technology, how it worked. Um, and then trying to bridge this gap between customers and kind of their expectations and stuff like that. So I'm going to continue on that conversation. You talk about, you know, missionary work with your customers. And this is an interesting thing to look at. You care a lot about safety. Yes. 
But a lot of times it feels like that's a second thought <laughs> to end users. I mean, expand more on that topic. Why does it feel like the people integrating the system who you want, you know, to buy it, yeah. <laughs> you know, why, why do you care more or why yeah. should they care more? Well, they should care more. Um, and the, <laughs> OSHA firmly believes that they should care more. But I think one of the challenges is that in general, safety standards are behind the curve um, because technology typically outpaces safety standards and safety is kind of a religion. You either believe in it or you don't mm -hmm. at some point. Um, and some of it is also just, they have, they're not sure what to do, where to start, how to start. And so a lot of where we're at right now with the AMR safety standards, since it was just published last December, is some of this missionary work. What is this standard? How should you be using it? Why should you be using it? Why is it important? How does it protect workers? Um, and how to take ownership of the process. And it, it's it's funny because when you when you look at it, they already do these things with the other types of material handling equipment they use day to day, forklifts and things like that. And so um, it's funny, you know, when someone asked me today at the talk, someone's like, well, are you responsible for safety or the, is the vendor responsible for safety or is the warehouse manager? And I'm like, the warehouse manager is responsible for safety. You know, you're there 24 seven operating your facility. Mm -hmm you're responsible for the workplace safety and the people in your care in some way. Yeah, that's a great point. So let's talk about um, deployments of AMRs as well um, in not so easy environments. Yes. Jake, Jake, I want you to frame this Yeah, I mean, up. so that's kind of just a summary of what you talked about with you know, a really good keynote this morning. You know, what are some big takeaways that people should have when, you know, there's a first time AMR user, what are some of the key aspects that they should be looking at to define those risk assessments? Yeah. So I think the first thing is, is, is it's all about the operating environment. You know, what is inside your warehouse? Do you have a lot of debris on the floor? Do you have water on the floor? Do you have glass walls in your warehouse? I don't know why you would have them, but <laughs> these are the types of things that are hard for robots to see or deal with. And, and, you know, being aware of that and understanding the change that you have to make in your facility to, to use them as part of your process. I think it's, sometimes I think it's funny because we, many people have Roombas and, and we all know the secret behind the Roomba, right? Like you clean up for the robot so the robot can clean up for you, right? <laughs> Let me pick everything off the floor, <laughs> put everything back, get all the kids' toys picked up, and then it can vacuum. <laughs> right. And the, the same is true in many, in many cases for technology, whether it's AMRs or industrial robot arms. We have to create the right environment for them to be successful. And, and it, it, I think one of the things is, is that people don't think about that, that what's true at home is at, true at work in many cases. And so what, what I think the other thing is, is that they need to start believing and, and, and acting on the principle that safety is a continual process and, and understanding the unique, you know, circumstances of their environment. For example, today we talked about a uh, Travis Association for the Blind, where about 50% of their staff is blind or visually impaired. And that's a really great one to talk on because there's so many unique circumstances that make that deployment interesting. And we can talk about how safety is applied in those unique circumstances. So I'm gonna change gears here as, as we get to the last part of this conversation. A big question that was in my mind before this was getting acquired, right? Zebra recently acquired you for 305 million, which was what, that's like 100X your seed round of investment that you got that you first mentioned with the 3 million. What goes through your head when you're getting acquired, right? Because there's got to be some rational thoughts. There's got to be some emotions. Just paint the picture for us. Yeah, I, I think that the first thing you think about is how do I do the right thing for everyone involved? Um, you know, building a startup is a lot of work. Uh, and you want to make sure that on the other side of this transaction, all the people that helped you get there are are happy and feeling that it was a success. And so the the thing is, is although the number is the number that everyone reads, there's all the finer details around making it a good transaction. And I think, I think that, you know, my focus since, since we started the process of trying to figure out, you know, what was the right fit? Because 
Zebra wasn't the only player involved in in the acquisition conversation, right? And making sure that it was the right fit, making sure that we saw a long term, you know, I guess vision with them, and that we could work together, and and that the team would be successful in that kind of environment. And so that's what went through my head. And then also, man, I never have to work again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I have to think that crosses your mind once, but you're still having a lot of fun doing the work. Yeah, of course, I get to talk to guys like you. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, right? Now you're just kind of in cruise mode, just talking about your passion. Yeah, absolutely. Well, what's the best way to get connected with Fetch Robotics? Yeah, so uh, we obviously have a website, we have an Instagram account, uh, Twitter, and you can always reach out to info or sales at Fetch Robotics or... Um, I think it's zebra.com. It's like fetch info at zebra.com or okay. something like that. Okay. But what is, what's the Instagram and Twitter handle, right? We don't get enough of those, right? But we need some more manufacturing in people's feeds, right? More robots. It's just <laughs> fetch robotics. Easy <laughs> enough. <laughs> Perfect. Simple. Great branding. Enjoyed the conversation. Melanie, thanks so much for jumping on with us today. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Cheers. Cheers.